Hello everyone, this is Mr. Nobody bringing you another installment of Making Nobody Happy. So today I want to talk about responsibilities. In particular, I want to talk about giving up responsibilities um, and responsibility we should not give up. So I'm a father who's served for many years. I served for many years as the primary caregiver for two young children. So how did that happen? I made deliberate choices that sacrificed my earning potential in the formal economy for value and quality of life gains for my entire family at home. Did I earn less? Absolutely. Was it 100% the right choice to make? Without a doubt. Even today, now that my kids are in school, figuring out how to make things work is often a serious challenge. I still work occasionally from bedtime to midnight or 1 a.m. so I can be there to take care of my kids during those precious hours when they're at home. As I wrote this, um, I wrote this originally by dictation because I was rushing to make deliveries so I could finish and be back in time to pick my kids up from school. So my life went a certain way because of choices that I made. Did I pay a price for those choices? Sure. Did I also gain things from that trade-off? For certain. People aren't simply the products of their environment or social conditions or economic structures. People aren't simply piano keys to be played by some larger forces. We have our own desires and values and we make our choices based on them. And there are demands and responsibilities and ambitions that we have to prioritize because it really isn't possible to have it all or do it all. We aren't superhuman, we aren't God. I often feel though, <clears throat> when I listen, uh, like experts and activists and politicians and the government are trying to convince me otherwise by making the argument that I could have it all and I wouldn't have to make any compromises, that my choices wouldn't need to matter so much and wouldn't have so such high stakes and complexity. They wouldn't risk so much if I would only just give them a, a little bit more power and a little bit more funding. And that's a tempting offer. Who wouldn't find that pitch appealing? Give up a bit more of my responsibility and my productive capacity and autonomy to them, and they will take care of me and relieve my load. To be perfectly frank, there are some responsibilities, though, that I'm reluctant to surrender to paid or government-funded substitutes and institutions, even for the sake of ease, convenience, and freedom especially when those solutions compete with or may even be trying to replace evolved solutions refined through thousands of generations and millions of years to give individual humans personal agency over the most fundamental responsibilities that human life entails. Responsibilities, I should add, whose assumption provides the greatest means for durable meaning and happiness in life that exists. Marriage and parenthood are by far the most important and meaningful and productive jobs you'll ever work at. And some of us are sensible enough to know that and make choices based on it. It isn't for everyone, but even if it isn't, it's still the strongest game in town. And it's the most available game in town, too, really. I've read Melinda Gates's book um, that she wrote recently, trying to solve the problems the way the world is structured. And... It was a good book, but it's essentially a plan to replace both the assets and feelings of marriage and parenthood with government and NGO programs so everyone can live their best lives and become an engineer or executive like her. And that's the kind of benevolent nightmare that not only won't work, but will fundamentally denigrate humanity, not empower that. Having said that, her motivations are completely understandable. They're wonderful motivations. They come from a good place. Um, she has seen the failure of husbands and the consequences for wives and mothers around the world. And she's seen the failure of parents and the consequences for their children. So she wants to put something in place to make up for those failures and ensure that these people are provided for regardless of the lack of human capital and structure in their personal lives. She's an engineer. And so she sees it as just a matter of building the right machine to assist us. More than a safety net, it's a vision for a new structure of human provision in relationships and productivity. A new system designed to solve the problems that marriage and parenthood were originally designed to solve. <clears throat> the 
problem is so much of our identity as a species and who we are on the most basic biological and psychological level is so deeply designed around these innate species technologies that it's extremely unclear and unpredictable what would result from deconstructing or replacing them. There's also the problem, uh, as Thomas Sowell has pointed out, he's often pointed out, um, how unlikely it is that any one person or even a group of people of finite intelligence and wisdom and capability and knowledge will, in the course of mere years, successfully devise a universally applicable solution to a problem that took tens of millions of years and thousands of lifetimes of experimentation and consequences to achieve the solutions that we already possess. Assuming you take a non-religious view of the world, in which case uh, you would look at it and say, well, how do you expect you as a tiny human to just be able to successfully come up with a replacement for what it took God to create? So the implications are the same regardless of which view you take of history and human nature. Human social relationships aren't arbitrary structures that we simply invented and came up with last week that we just remove or replace as we wish. They're adaptive, they're evolved or designed. How they ended up designed isn't the issue. In either case, you end up in the same place. We're designed for these species technologies. They're part of the species itself. We're designed for them on the deepest levels of our being with internal motivations toward them. So trying to design a solution or alternative to the existing pathologies of those systems, which certainly do exist, by removing or replacing them does not respect or acknowledge the fact that they are endemic to our being. They're endemic to our very sanity, happiness, development, and meaning in life. It's like offering to remove our capacity to see to save us from seeing things that might disturb us, or removing our capacity to feel pain lest we suffer a terrible trauma. It's hubris and delusion, it's anti-human, and it's doomed to fail. This kind of solution might prove even worse than the problems it's actually trying to address. By seeking to abolish them, you're actually trying to abolish something about humanity itself, something intrinsic to our nature. So sex and parenthood and even work weren't made for us. They're not just things we came up with. We are made for them, quite literally. And any philosophy, no matter how well-meaning or how accurately it sees the problems that we face or how genuinely it desires to address them, that cannot understand them, cannot help them. You cannot provide greater health to someone if you don't deeply understand the nature of the patient that you're treating or the nature of the diseases that afflict them. If you don't really know what health looks like and where it comes from and what drives you towards it. And hardly any of the unconstrained utopianist theorists really do. They take their vision for granted. They think they can just make up something new. Um, they're so busy designing what life should be like, they've never really looked hard enough at what life is. So Melinda wants to design a better world, like a benevolent god. The world that we live in is often a painful and tragic one. And she has a tender, caring heart, and she has the skill and determination to try to do something about it, and that's wonderful. But her philosophy, her medical and moral theory, is flawed. She has the unconstrained utopian vision, as uh, Thomas Sowell would put it. Um, there's a kind of nobility and ambitions and benevolence to her rejection of the tragic or constrained vision of the world. She invites us to imagine what the world could be like. You getting to be more like her, among other things. That's part of, that's part of her ideal vision. <clears throat> Unfortunately, uh, attempting a broad-scale redefinition of the most basic fundamental structures of human society has not tended to be one of the great success stories of history. Utopian perfectionism and optimistic creativity make for fantastic helpers, but dangerous guides. The unconstrained vision can be the crowning grace of humanity when it supports and builds on and cares for and nurtures the realities and the emergent solutions of the tragic constrained vision of the world. 
The problem isn't that one vision is right and one is wrong. The problem is when you get them the wrong way round so they don't work as intended. If you put the tragic vision in charge of trying to perfect the world, you might not go anywhere or do anything because it might not see that there is anything that can or should be done. It can become cynical and careless, heedless uh, of the cost of its own means and unwilling to challenge or reinvent them. It, become, it can become callous and disengaged and selfish, but it's very good at seeing the world as it is and making practical personal decisions about how to understand and deal with it, how to make the necessary trade-offs. Now, if you put the unconstrained vision in charge of understanding the world and deciding what to do about it, it won't respect the world as it is or try to comprehend it or, creation, or, 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 or appreciate it. It'll just try to ignore it or replace it. The unconstrained vision will wander too far and do too much, things that never should have been done in an attempt to remake the world according to its preferences, whatever the cost. It can be naive, careless, dangerously unrealistic, and dangerously experimental. Both visions can become tyrannical. And both can be blind to the cost of their approach and justify them, justify it too easily in the service of their vision. So both outlooks have their value. You have to respect the constrained vision and you have to love the unconstrained vision. But if you can't marry both of those attitudes, you're in dangerous territory and you'll have a hard time addressing or understanding the world. These outlooks they're part of the fundamental psychological and social technology that we as humans have been given to understand and address the world and its challenges. <clears throat> and you probably can't be or possess both of them in a single person. At least it's very hard to. That's okay. You don't need to. You don't need to have... Uh, you, you, you don't have to be everything all the time. That's almost impossible. But you do need to have a relationship to the other vision and have that relationship be in the proper shape. If you're tragic, but you can't love the utopian, you're going to go wrong. If you're a utopian and you can't respect the tragic, you will go wrong too. You'll be missing half of the human vision of the world and half of human capability and you'll inevitably become imbalanced. And that is all for today. We'll see you next time.